Before we formally start our program, please be informed that this webinar is being recorded, subject to the policies and guidelines on the Data Privacy Act of the Philippines. As part of our netiquette, kindly be reminded of the following. Please mute your microphone and video while the speaker is presenting. Ample time will be allotted for question and answer after the presentation. Questions will be entertained using video or the message chat or the options chat as guided by the session moderator. All attendees are advised to exercise caution in taking screenshots of the webinar and the presenter. Since this is an academic undertaking, observe proper attire in attending the webinar. Thank you and welcome to this webinar. 
Arriba. Faded away when hope is gone and no one is around to light away. When all the world's unkind, the first you are to find, love is cold and no one's there to hold you feel alone. I'll be there when you. Catch you each time you fall. I feel your light in the dark. I hold you close to my heart. You have my word, my friend. I'll be there. I'll shelter you from the rain. Help you ease all the pain. Keep you safe. Safe in my arms, I never 
themselves and pray if they seek my face and humble themselves and turn from their wicked ways I will hear from heaven and forgive their sins I will hear from heaven
My side are guiding me all night, but you know when I'm feeling down, I close my eyes and you give me those warm hugs. Are you alright? It's not.
sa pananampalataya tayo po ay magpuri at magpasalamat sa Diyos sa napakagandang araw na ito magpasalamat din po tayo sa Kanya dahil tinipon niya tayo pinagsama-sama niya tayo bilang isang sambayanan na nagpapahayag ng mga magagandang bagay na ginawa ng Diyos sa salit-saling lahi. Yan ang diwa ng pagalangin ng mahal na ina.
Salawak ng dagat na aking tinatawid Tanging pangalan mo ang siyang laging sinasambit Hanap-hanap ang pangako ng iyong lambing Inaasam na tuwinay nasa iyong piling Sa araw-araw na paglusong ko sa buhay Ikaw lang ang sangsit na isang pantay Dayuhin man ako ng lungkot at hirap Ang ulang kong lagi lingap mo't yakap Salamat Maria sa iyong pagbisan Sa bawat hapis, luwalhati at tuwa namin Salamat sa pag-ibig at sa bawat tanangin Salamat sa iyo sa mga pagdamay mo Kami patuloy na magmamahal sa iyo Pero napakaganda po na sa pagpapasinaya ng napakayaman na misyon, misyon ng Kolehyo de San Juan de Letran, dumadalaw muli sa kanyang orihinal na tahanan, walang iba kundi intramuros, ang Nuestra Senyora del Santísimo Rosario La Naval de Manila na unang nanirahan dito sa Intramuros sa unang Santo Domingo Church at dahil nga po sa gera siya ay inilikas. Salamat naman at siya ay inilikas sa UST hanggang siya ay nailuklo sa kanyang kampang kasalukuyang tahanan sa shrine ng Santo Domingo sa Quezon City. Subalit, dito siya sa Intramuros unang nanirapan. At mula nung Second World War, eto siya, dumadalaw muli. Welcome home, Mama Mary. Welcome home.
Ulster uh, Social Weather Station reports close to half of the 27 points. COVID-19 infections in the Philippines spiked to over 200,000. Lord Jesus Christ, your love for St. Dominic inspires us now to implore your help and seek your intercession for all the Dominicans in the Philippines and the whole world. In confidence, we ask you to strengthen them with the virtues of chastity, poverty, and obedience that they may live with one mind and heart. Instruct them in holiness with your goodness and the mysteries of the Holy Rosary, and sanctify them in truth and love through the Holy Eucharist and penance. Give them the grace of faith, sweet hope in the midst of life's bitterness, burning charity, and the precious gift of final perseverance. Lead to this order men and women willing to live and preach the truth of the gospel after the example of Saint Dominic, and mercifully grant that we may all be moved with a zeal for your glory in saving souls and become partakers of your crown in heaven. Amen. Saint Dominic de Guzman, pray for us.
land, domestic air and domestic sea travel to and from Metro Manila shall be suspended beginning 15, 2020, March, March 15, 2020, and to end on April 14, 2020. dahil wala kami pira, wala kami pambili bigas. Mahirap eh. Mahirap pag mahirap. Walang pagwakunan. Ang kailangan, pagkain. Ako si Julian Christopher C. Morada OP, ang bagong coordinator ng kadaupan ngayong taon ng pandemya. Masasabi ko na hindi po mo nagsimula ang pandemyang ito, ang kadaupan na ang frontliner ng Santo Domingo sa pagtulong sa mga nangangailangan. sa lahat. Ako po si Monique Bay Solis. Nag-aaral po ako sa National Teachers College at kumukuha ng po sa BSHM at sa ngayon ay nasa Tokyo. Isa po ako sa Kadaupang Scouter. Ako po si Cherry Regula. Bata pa na magsimula ako sa Kadaupang. 1997 na magsimula ako mag-jong sa grupo. Sa Makatawid, 24 years na akong kadaupan. Ang laking tulong na naibigay sa akin ng kadaupan simula ng nandito. Scholar ako. Sa tatlong taong ko dito, natulungan ang aking pag-aaral, lalo na sa tuition at pang sa araw-araw. Pag-join ako sa kadaupan, marami akong narealize. Nakita ko kung ano ang purpose ko sa buhay. Bilang isang rin, naintindihan ko kung ano nga ba ang ibig sabihin ng salitang tulong. Salamat kadaupan! Salamat kadaupan! Ang isang kadaupan member ay hindi lamang frontliner. Ang mga frontliner ang unang sumasabak sa digmaan. Higit pa riyan, ang isang kadaupan member ay isa ring faithliner. Bakit? Dahil sa labang ito, hindi lang namin dala ang aming mga sarili. Dala rin namin ang Diyos. Sa pagtulong namin sa kapwa, siya ay aming kasama. Kaya ang isang kadaupan member ay hindi lamang frontliner, siya rin ay isang faithliner. Sa laban ng pandemyang ito, hindi namin kaya ng kami lamang. Sana ay kasama namin kayo sa pagtulong sa mga nangangailangan. Kaya ngayon po ay kumakato kami sa inyong mga puso na sana ay matulungan niyo ang kadaupan upang maipagpatuloy pa ang kanyang misyon na pagtulong sa mga nangangailangan at mga nahihirapan. Maraming salamat po sa inyong lahat at naway pagpalain kayo ng Panginoon. Hello mga mukha-others, ako po si Brother Nico Paulo Moron Upi, 
ang inyong Coordinator General sa Mukhaad. Masiglang ugnayan ng mga kabataang hinuhubog sa anyo ng anak ng Diyos. Masiglang ugnayan. Dito po sa Mukhaad, priority po ng aming apostolate ang mga kabataan. Kung saan, we build youthful relationship and commitment with others. At dito rin po sa Mukhaad, hinuhubog namin ang mga kabataan upang maging anyo ni Kristo sa ibang tao. To be the face of Christ to others sa pamamagitan ng mga sessions and activities that will empower them na maging mabuting tagasunod ni Kristo. Subalit, hindi maiiwasan ang mga challenges na dulot ng virus at pandemic na siyang nakaaapekto sa pagtupad ng aming mga plano para sa taong ito. But we are hopeful na sa tulong nyo at ng ating Panginoon, walang virus o pandemic na makahahadlang at makapipigil sa amin sa paghubog sa ating mga kabataan. Sabi nga sa aming team ngayong taon, Mukhaad Viral, spreading the good news, bridging distances. No social distancing, no pandemic, no virus can hinder us to be the face of Christ to others. Kaya mga mukhaaders, batch 31, walang iwanan. Before we formally start our program, please be informed that this webinar is being recorded, subject to the policies and guidelines on the Data Privacy Act of the Philippines. As part of our netiquette, kindly be reminded of the following. Please mute your microphone and video while the speaker is presenting. Ample time will be allotted for question and answer after the presentation. Questions will be entertained using video or the message chat or the options chat as guided by the session moderator. All attendees are advised to exercise caution in taking screenshots of the webinar and the presenter. Since this is an academic undertaking, observe proper attire in attending the webinar. Thank you and welcome to this webinar. Arriba! Another blessed day to all of us to start this day's program. Let us have our opening prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.
name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. To give us a summary of the first day of the conference, please watch this video. Bonjour, guren tan, buenas tardes, ciao boy toy, selamat malam, isang mapagpalang araw po sa ating lahat. Good morning for those in the US, good afternoon for those in Europe, good evening from us here in the Philippines, good day and mabuhay to everyone as I could not mention all the time zones. This pandemic has disrupted the different facets of our lives, including preaching. We can find consolation in the fact that we can still gather, though virtually. We want to hear and learn from each other and be inspired by each other. How do we preach God's closeness to us while keeping our safe distance from one another? How do we preach the joy of the gospel in the midst of loss? I wish to say that you, you dear brothers and sisters, are a sign of hope for the church and the human family as you strove to feed the hungers, the many hungers intensified by the pandemic. The intellectual mission of the order and its mission to preach Veritas is an important antidote to another pernicious pandemic. Fake news and half-truths which are in fact half-lies. Indeed, moments of crisis can become occasions of grace and moments of creativity. How do we preach God's friendship at a time when we hear people fomenting fractures and divisions within the church? How do we preach in a time of the pernicious pandemics of indifference, clericalism, divisions, fake news, hopelessness in our times? We are not an order of homilists but an order of preachers. In these trying times, when people seem to be lost in despair, Dominic offers us Spem Miram. Ultimately, hope is grounded on the certainty that God will never abandon us. Hope is the assurance that God abides in the mysteries of joy, sorrow, glory, and light of our lives. In the times of joy and sorrow, glory and light in these mysteries, there is always hope because Christ abides in us. everyone we are happy to see you again as we get the ball rolling let us send our greetings to the participants around the world so just like what we did yesterday please open your cameras and wave hi once we call on each region okay so let's get started we call those from north america Wave hi, wave hi. Hello, hello, sisters. We call those from South America. Hello, hello. Buenas tardes. <laughs> from Europe. 
Good afternoon, those in Europe. Hello, sisters, hello, brothers. From Africa. Wave, wave, wave. Everyone who's watching. And from the Asia and the Pacific. Oh, okay, now we see them. Thank you so much for your participation. Today, we shall be listening to a preaching of a loving wife and mother. She is an associate professor of homiletics at Aquinas Institute of Theology in St. Louis, Missouri, and founding director of the school's master's degree program in catechesis of the Good Shepherd. She has served as a catechist with children ages 3 to 12 since 1996 and has been a formation leader with the U.S. National Association of Catechesis of the Good Shepherd since 1999 and carried out duties as a member of the association's formation committee since 2004. She has served as a senior editor of Human Development Magazine and is the author of numerous books including the award-winning volumes, Redeeming Administration, published in 2013, and Redeeming Conflict, published in 2016. And her newest publication, Let's Talk About Truth, in 2020. Today, she commits half time to traveling nationally and internationally, doing conflict education and mediation work with Triad Consulting Group, Negotiation Project, based in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Dear sisters and brothers, ladies and gentlemen, let us welcome Professor Anne Garrido, Doctor of Ministry. Kamusta po. Thank you so much for welcoming me to be with you here today. The only thing that would make this better for me would be if we were able to be together face to face in person. I know that I have wanted to travel to the Philippines ever since I was a teen. In fact, at the age of 18, um, at one point there was a Filipino culture festival in my home city of St. Louis. And there was a drawing that was to be held that anybody who won the drawing would get a free trip to the Philippines. And I was so sure that I would, my name was gonna be drawn that I hauled my whole family down to the drawing. Needless to say, I was crushed when my name was not drawn. And in my 18 year old sort of way, I thought that that would be my one and only chance that I would ever have to get to go to the Philippines and that I'd never have that opportunity again. And Father Clarence proved me wrong on that two years ago when inviting me to get to be part of this gathering. Um, but then yes, COVID, what's different is that in being 52 rather than being 18, I no longer think that I shall never get to go to the Philippines. I just hear it as a not yet. And I live in constant hope that we will get to meet each other face to face in an adventure that lies just around the corner, which is perhaps a good way to get into the topic of lay preaching. Because like my aspirations for traveling to the Philippines, my aspirations for lay preaching in the Catholic tradition have also involved a whole lot of dashed expectations that I've begun to understand simply as not yet. And as crazy as it sounds, I actually continue to have a whole lot of hope. One of the things which I've come to value a great deal about the Dominican preaching colloquia that have been blessed to be a part of in the past couple of years is their honesty. I see the global Dominican community as being very bold in holding the conversations that have been held. And I know that these gatherings um, have been a safe space for many Dominican preachers to test out new ideas that they have, new frameworks, which will continue to be discussed and refined 
long after the colloquia itself is over. And what I'd like to share today, I hope stands inside of that tradition. It's a perspective that's born of my own experience as a preacher that might be a little bit of a hot take, which is what my young adult son always says. And surely it's in need of further refinement. And what I'm trusting is that this is the community that can help me in that process. So I'd like to begin with a little bit of my own vocational journey as a preacher so that you have a good sense of the context out of which I'm gonna share the remarks that emerge. And then I'll share a little bit about my own thinking about this term lay preaching at this moment in history, and then maybe close with a few words of encouragement for those who identify as lay preachers in the current church. So there'll be three parts to my talk, which I don't know, maybe makes you think that I belong more at a Jesuit conference on preaching than a Dominican one. But I promise you that I'm going to throw Thomas in there along the way. So, so we're, we're all good. So let me start with first part, that part about my own vocational journey. I'm not entirely sure where to begin the story of my journey, except to say that I'm the oldest of eight children in a close-knit Catholic family. So finding my voice was never really an issue for me. First, because as the oldest and oldest children, I am told, tend to be very good at bossing others around. But also because in that there were eight of us, if you couldn't insert your voice in a way that you could be heard, you might never get fed. So I should also say that I was raised in a parish following the Second Vatican Council that had four priests on the staff at the time, a couple of whom were really fine preachers. And so from very, very early on, I got to see preaching done well and experience the impact of good preaching on one's own spiritual growth. Said Contra, there's my Thomas reference for those of you who almost missed it. I also got to see preaching done poorly. And I had lots and lots of opportunities to sit in the pew and wonder how I might communicate the same thing differently. I don't know how I first maneuvered myself into a pulpit space, but I do know that these were the years following the council. And so I was already lecturing at all school masses by third grade. And then I have a picture of myself in eighth grade leading the parish rosary. And it always felt like standing in that space was just a place where I belonged. And it wasn't so much of a stretch in my own imagination to see myself as speaking from there, especially since I already was spending so much time rewriting father's homilies in my mind. I was 21 when one of our parish priests asked me to give a talk on the multiplication of the loaves and the fishes as part of a Wednesday evening Lenten series. And I was 22 when the pastor went on vacation and another one of our parish priests asked me to offer that same reflection on the loaves and fish at Sunday mass when that reading appeared in the lectionary. And I know that that was a really powerful experience for me, I think for the parish as well. And I wanna say it hooked me in some way. So that a couple of years later, when I was a teacher on the Pacific Island of Guam, again, yeah, so close to the Philippines and yet so far away, another near miss, um, I, was, I got a brochure in the mail from Aquinas Institute of Theology in St. Louis, inviting me to the Summer Preaching Institute. I was newly married at the time, I guess about 24 years old, and my husband suggested that I fly all the way back to the States to attend. How I got on the mailing list for a Dominican School of Theology when I was on the other side of the world I have no idea. And how, why my husband thought when we were barely making ends meet that it would be a good idea for the two of us if I flew all the way across the globe again to attend this institute, I also have no idea. These are the places in my own story where I have to believe in such a thing as the strong arm of God. 
But I also, I don't wanna lose sight here that this was made possible by the nimble hands of real human beings who saw little tiny openings like a Lenten series or a summer preaching institute. We saw little possibilities like the pastor going on vacation and widened those spaces for me, made opportunities happen for me. Through the gift of scholarship dollars, again, through the generosity of others, not myself, I was able to pursue a master's of divinity at Aquinas Institute, which provided more opportunities to study the practice of preaching. And the gift of a job at Aquinas allowed me to go on for my doctorate in homiletics there. And then in a strange twist of fate, for a really short time, I became the director of the doctoral program in preaching. And in addition to getting to now teach preaching occasionally, I now do public speaking and writing full time, some in the business world, but mostly in the Christian world. And most of that experience has been live or in person, but in the past 18 months, much of it has been on Zoom. And then also in the form of podcasts and a bi-monthly blog. Uh, last month, I got the chance to tape an hour with EWTN, which was a whole new and unexpected experience for me. And I know that I'm breezing through the details here because I don't want this talk to become about me. Rather, I just wanna give the context out of which I've come to think about this topic of lay preaching in the city and in the world during this time of pandemic. And so here's my hot take, as my son would call it. I don't really think that lay preaching is all that great of an idea. Bet you didn't expect to hear that come out of my mouth. So let me back up and clarify what I mean when I'm saying this. In casual conversations around Catholic preaching, the kind that kind of take place in the grocery store or whatnot, there exists a general assumption that the normal place where preaching happens is within the mass and that the people who normally do preaching are priests and on occasion deacons and the ordained are the ones who preach. And then sometimes by special dispensation because a priest or a deacon is not available, if we're really desperate, we might ask a lay person to speak. I just want to pause there and I want to reframe the contours of the conversation to better align here with the Second Vatican Council's ecclesiology. From the perspective of the council, we might say that the entirety of the people of God are to be preaching in the broadest sense of that word at all times, yes, with their lives. And then though also where fitting, also in their daily speech. As it says in 1 Peter 3.15, always be ready to give an accounting to anyone who asks you the reason for your hope. And in the ideal world, all of us who are baptized should be able to be articulate enough about our faith that we could share what animates us, at least at a basic level, to whoever that asks spontaneously. Now, we are definitely not there yet. We're going to have to do a whole lot more catechetical work to help people feel really comfortable to do that. But then we might say among the baptized, there are going to be those with a particular charism for sharing Christian hope. And what do I mean by that? A charism is a particular strength that's given by God to members of the Christian community for the sake of the building up of that community. So one time I was on a plane with a sister of charity and she put it to me this way. She said, you know, all Christians are called to be hospitable. 
But when we say as sisters of Christian charity that we have a charism for hospitality, it means that we have been gifted with a particular strength for hospitality that keeps us going and being hospitable when others would have reached their limits a long time ago. And so when I'm talking about a charism for preaching, what I'm referring to is a particular strength that has been given to articulate the Christian hope in a way that's beyond what would be expected of, of the average person in the pew. A charism for preaching might show up in a variety of different ways, perhaps in the experience of finding voice at a very early age, perhaps in a sense of comfort in being in the pulpit, perhaps in a sense of natural uh, gifts for communication and connecting with other people away with words. I think that a charism for preaching is one of many different charisms that God has gifted the church with. And it's really important for the building up of the church because it allows us to be church more fully in the world. And here's another point about charisms that I want to make though. God is the one who gives charisms, but the person who receives a charism needs to do their part in developing that charism so that it can be of ever greater service to the church. That it can be, that can mean specialized training or mentorship, ongoing spiritual direction, a life of prayer. Moreover, the church has a responsibility to order, to organize charisms for the common good. And some charisms may not need a whole bunch of official organizing. For example, the charism of hospitality or the charism of caring for the sick or feeding the hungry. If everyone were visiting the elderly or everyone were providing meals for the hungry, the world would only be a better place. But some charisms really do benefit from discernment and ordering because you can't have everybody leading the community or you can't have everyone in the classroom trying to teach at the same time, or you can't have everyone trying to administer the parish finances, you would end up in a state of chaos. And I think preaching is one of those charisms that over the history of time, the church has said would benefit from some development, training, and then some ordering. So we could randomly choose any decade in the church's history and find evidence of our community life being thrown into chaos by the preaching of those who perhaps never had that charism or who had the charism, but were not well formed for that ministry, who interpreted scripture in skewed ways, who were psychologically abusive, who became disconnected from the practice of prayer in their own life. And you could probably also, in every decade of the church's history, find absences, find holes in the story. When those who had the charism of preaching and prepared themselves well for that ministry, were nevertheless unable to exercise that charism within the order of the church at that time, and that the church was less for it. And you can see why problems on any three of those fronts are not good for the life of the church. So when I say, that I think that lay preaching is not a great idea. I mean that in two different ways. One, that if by lay, you mean the dictionary definition of the term as amateur or inexperienced or not trained, not prepared, no special expertise, then I don't think that's a good idea. Preachers need to be people who not just have some natural gifts, but also who have a commitment to ongoing learning and study and formation in the ministry. 
And that includes priests and deacons as well. Because in that sense, many priests and deacons are also sadly lay. In essence, that they're poorly prepared preachers. But if by the word lay, you mean not ordered, not organized in any way on behalf of the church, I think we're also asking for trouble. Because too often in the church's life, we get stuck in the question, is this person ordained under holy orders as the starting point for the conversation about who should be preaching? When perhaps the more important question is, how shall we organize in a holy and a healthy way the preaching ministry of the church so that it can really thrive? How can we organize and order those whom we've identified as having a charism for preaching? Because that first frame starts with holy orders and hopes that somehow the charism for preaching might follow. That second frame starts with charism and then asks, what sort of ordering would be helpful so that those who are preaching in the name of the church are collaborating in a shared ministry and are pulling in the same direction. And that seems to me to be very important. And I say that not because as a preacher who's not ordained, I'm really hungry for more order in my life, but because I know that if I were a bishop, I would want to have a relationship with those who are speaking about matters of faith and doctrine publicly in the name of the church, no matter where that would be, in mass or in schools or in prisons or on street corners, wherever preaching's happening. And I think that the rise of social media, most particularly the experience of the pandemic in the last 18 months, has brought the questions that I am framing here to a new level of intensity. At the start of COVID-19, Christians around the globe stopped going to services in person and many have never returned. Maybe they will, but a fair number began shopping for preachers online. And suddenly it was no longer not just the ordained in their own tradition that they were listening to, but preachers in other congregations and preachers who were not ordained in any congregation. Some churches decided that Eucharist was not really something that should or could be celebrated online. And there was a resurgence of word services with many different people preaching. I find it curious that Pope Francis named the first Word of God Sunday in January 2020, right before COVID stopped the world cold. Like, did he have some sort of premonition that we were about to meet God more in word than in sacrament in the weeks and months to come? And furthermore, during this season of time, we saw a rise Perhaps we're still seeing a rise in tremendous theological animosity online. The kind of stuff that would rival Arius and Athanasius in the Council of Nicaea. And many people passed off their interpretation of the Catholic tradition as the interpretation of the Catholic tradition, that even the Pope himself was not considered Catholic enough. I would suggest that the majority of, Christ, of preaching in the Christian tradition right now is not actually happening in person, in churches, on Sunday mornings from the pulpit. Rather, the pandemic has exacerbated, accelerated a trend that was already well on its way which is that the majority of preaching right now is actually being experienced online. And it is primarily being exercised by those who are not ordained, not really organized or ordered in any way. And often by those who have little theological or ministerial preparation for the task that they've undertaken of communicating the faith in a public way. And if we as the church 
choose to focus great amounts of energy on who can preach at mass, we will be missing the big picture and in a big way. Our efforts will be like rearranging lawn chairs on the Titanic. So when I say that I don't think that lay preaching is a great idea, am I saying that those of us who are baptized but not ordained should stop preaching our faith? No, I'm not saying that at all. In so many situations, the spirit of God compels us to do so. What I am saying is that beyond the sense of a call to preach that so many of us have experienced in our lives, we need to keep making sure that we are trying to develop our gifts to the best of our abilities because no one should really be subject to lay as an unprepared amateur preaching. And moreover, what I'm saying is that the church as a whole needs to really wrestle with the question of how to discern the charism for preaching within the people of God. How do we nurture and develop that charism wherever it's found? And how do we order it in a holy way so that it can thrive, not for the sake of the people who've been given the charism, but for the sake of the building up of the church, which is the reason why all charisms are given in the first place. Sometimes people ask me, are you upset that you can't preach more? As if somehow my rights to preaching were being denied by the church. And I always think to myself, no, because I'm not the one who's being denied access to my voice. Inside of my head, I can hear myself preaching perfectly well, but I feel sad for the church because I think that our mission in the world suffers when we don't get good preaching. And when we're less than who we could be as a community, when those who've been given the charism to preach and are well prepared to do so are limited in the space where they can exercise that charism. I'm not mad about it. And I'm certainly not crushed. I'm just disappointed because I think specifically the liturgical life of the church suffers. And I really love and value the liturgy. But I just say to myself, not yet. And I know that I'm 52 and that not yet is not forever. I still think that it lies just beyond the bend because I know that even if I don't get the chance to see it in my lifetime, I know Isaiah 55:10 that God's work, God's word has a work to do in the world. And as scripture says, it shall not return to me empty, but shall do what pleases me, achieving the end for which I sent it. And if the word does its work through me, I am happy about that. And if it happens to be through somebody else, that's fine too. This isn't about me, it's about the word finding a way. And so part three, let me wrap up with just a few words of encouragement. For those of us in this colloquium who preach out of our baptism and a sense of a call to preach, but are not among those who are ordained in the church with specific faculties to preach. It is unlikely that it is our lot in life to determine who has access to pulpits within churches and who does not. And upon reaching the pearly gates of heaven, others are gonna be held accountable for what they did or did not do with that power to determine the ordering of such things. But that's not really our problem. What we will be held accountable to 
is what we did with the gifts that were given to us. How did we develop to the best of our abilities, our capacity to preach effectively and impactfully? Did we live lives immersed in scripture? Were we faithful to praying with the text? Did we study? Did we take classes? Did we practice and ask for feedback and mentoring? Did we continue to try to grow in this ministry? And whenever a door opened for us, did we say yes? Were we open to preaching the good news wherever and whenever a path appeared? And whatever path that did appear, did we speak our words with care and with charity, whether that be in a church pulpit or online or in a blog? Were we faithful to the text? Because that in the end is all that we really need to worry about. And so I put before you today a companion on the journey, a saint who at varying points in Dominican history has commanded great devotion, though she may still be unfamiliar to many, Tecla of Iconium. Her story is found in the apocryphal text of the Acts of Paul and Tecla, and it didn't make the canon which will come as no surprise when you hear it. But she nevertheless is widely revered, especially in the Orthodox tradition. And her feast is September 23rd. So just, just a few weeks past. And here's the general gist of her story. Takla was a young woman who heard St. Paul preach and wanted to convert her whole life over to Christ and to join the preaching mission. And she asked to be baptized and to go with Paul. The problem was that she was engaged and her parents forbid it. And Tecla's fiance brought Tecla to court for shaming him. And she was ordered to be burned at the stake, but a sudden deluge of rain came from the heavens and put out the fire and Tecla escaped. And so she pursued Paul on the road and she asked him to baptize her and allow him, allow her to come with him. And Paul said, no, but Tecla heard that as a not yet. And she followed him to Antioch. And there another young man fell in love with her and asked Paul for her hand in marriage, thinking that he was her guardian. And Paul denies even knowing who Tecla is, and he leaves her on her own. And Tecla rebuffs the young man's interest, and she is once again condemned to death. And wild beasts are led into the arena, but they refuse to eat her. And finally, Tecla has had enough. If no one is willing to baptize her, she is just going to have to baptize herself. And so she spots a tank with man-eating seals in it, and she jumps into the tank. And Tecla says, I baptize myself in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And the seals all die immediately. I promise you I'm not making this up. And one last time, they try to tie Tecla up between the bowls. But the cords turn to ash. And the last line of this episode reads, she was as one unbound. Tecla went off on her own as a preacher and as a healer. And she lived until the age of 90. Because sometimes you can only do what you can do within the unordered systems that you find yourself in. But even then, it turns out that it's still quite a lot that you can do. And while officiating at your own baptism does not sound like a great idea, you do the best you can in the circumstance. And in your charity, in your study, in your creativity, in your ingenuity, in your devotion to the word of God, be as one unbound, because every no is really a not yet, and that there's always reason to hope that other adventures lie just 
around the corner. Thank you for the wonderful insights, Professor Angarido. One of the most striking words to me and hopefully to our audience as well was commitment. An additional learning I would say uh, to some of us is about Thecla of Iconium who baptized herself to the surprise of the seals who were martyred in that water. On a personal note, I would like to affirm what you said about exercising our charism given by God with commitment to ongoing formation. We appreciate and acknowledge the lay preacher's dedication and faithfulness as each of them bring God's word to the world. At this juncture, dear sisters and brothers, we shall have an open forum. For those who would like to raise their questions, kindly click the raise hand button or you may send your questions via Zoom meeting chat box, stating your name and the institute or organization you belong to. Then we will call you uh, uh, I, in the chat box or read your message uh, and forward it to our speaker. Magandang araw, Professor Angarido. That's a greeting among us Filipinos to say, to say good day. Okay. Uh, let us call on our brother, Scott Stein Kirshner, has raised his hand. Uh, thank you, Anne. That was that was lovely, and I love the shock value of being against lay preaching. <laughs> and, and the shock value of, but what about the seals, the poor seals? That's so not a Franciscan story. Um, anyway, <laughs> um, I run, as you know, but everybody perhaps doesn't know, I've run a re website with a Dominican preaching from around the world for about 16 years or something and Anne's one of my better preachers I might say best preacher but I don't want her head to swell because she's so not lay you know what I mean in in the way she said it so you know in the word we have daily preaching and it was a way even back when you know when the internet really got going to say what does it mean to preach in this new place and people are really funny you know my preachers they sign up every day and and they say well you know what reading should i use and we base it on the lectionary but there's options no you're the preacher you decide do you want to read the reading or something will you decide be the preacher or not um but the balance is always that question of lay preaching and how do we guarantee that we have good preaching, that it's on topic, that it's, I, my province runs a new um, video preaching thing as well called A Word of Hope. And A Word of Hope is just the friars from my province and just a handful, like six or eight of us doing it all. I think in some ways we're better preachers than if you counted up every preacher in the word. <laughs> <laughs> because we're more trained and more selected, you know, just these people. But the variety is also important, which is a subtext of what you were saying with your, the church is missing the gifts in the liturgy of a variety of voices that we really need to have. And I think that's the best thing about the word is I can listen to people from around the world, friars, sisters, nuns, lay people, um, deacons, priests, the whole. And how do we maintain that kind of variety and keep the quality up and, and heard that 
group of cats. <laughs> like where, how do we do that balance? That's the real question. And how do we do it as a family? In what sense is the word a Dominican thing from the whole family? And how can we expand other ministries like that? To let the whole family preach, but then who decides what's good and who's in and who's out? And these are the, the questions I have that maybe a forum like this is the perfect place to bring it up and say, yeah, how else do we preach and as a family so that we're not just amateurs all, or that we have a more powerful voice against this onslaught of amateur preaching? Okay, enough. No, Scott, thank you. I mean, I think you raise a lot of really good questions there. And I think one of the reasons why the word is such an incredibly important ministry of the order is because it is one of the very few places where the whole Dominican family lay and um, found religious and ordained, like all of us are preaching together. Um, and in that, in that uh, forum, I think in some ways you are responsible for some of the ordering which is the calling all of us who are um, part of that ministry to continue to grow and to improve. And um, one of the things which I think hinders, uh, look, see, I'm stuck with the brand that's from LA, but those of us who, who are not ordained and who are preaching, one of the things that hinders us from getting better is lack of any opportunity for practice. And so I think in the community that exists on the word, when we're listening to each other, and if we continue to listen to each other and we see what each other's doing, like that is one of the ways that we do get a little bit better because we're getting more and more space to practice the craft of preaching. Um, and what I hear you saying is that there's, you just experience the tension between, I want to be a space that lets new voices in and I want to make sure that the quality is really good at the same time. And I guess as in all things within Catholic tradition, it's not an either or, it's a both and. Like we can hold on to both of those values at the exact same time and not, not let go of either of them because, because for the sake of the word, both are really important. The quality part and the, um, and the, uh, the inclusivity of, of many, many different voices. Yeah. But thank you for the work that you're doing there. And I, I, if those of you in the room haven't gotten to see the work of the word and the community that's gathered there, I would highly encourage that site of uh, wordop.org. It's a, it's a great ministry of the order. Thank you. Thank you so much for that question. Uh, thank you, ma'am. And we have... Uh, with us also another participant, Dave Cesar de la Cruz OP has raised his hand. Hello, good evening, uh, good day, uh, Miss Anne, and greetings from the Philippines. I am Dave de la Cruz from the Lay Dominicans of Marikina. Uh, you are an inspiration. Thank you for your sharing. But there's now in my mind of you know, playing this thought of with Pope Francis open minded. Uh, uh, teachings, for example, women in the liturgy, acolytes for women, uh, women for acolytes and inst instituted acolytes and lectors. Do you think that there will be a possibility or maybe in, in researches that uh, lay people will be allowed to preach in the liturgy uh, based on church history? Because we all know that before, even in the early church, uh, apostles are considered as lay people and uh, so, will there be a possibility of this uh, of this new ministry for lay preaching in the liturgy? Well, like I said, I, I'm always in the category of the no doesn't mean forever, right? It's like we always live in a not yet. And so I think what Pope Francis has done is he's raised the question again. And I think part of it is that the question just keeps needing to stay alive. Um, so I I think that that is going to happen. I think the question, I think it already is happening, right? I think the question is more, how do we within our, at the congregational level, how do we animate the charisms that are present within our congregations? So how do we, how, how do we identify people in our congregation who do seem to have a charism in this regard, 
how do we help them to get the formation and the training that would really help them to excel, kind of like what Father Scott and I are talking about. And then the question is, I mean, because both of those are essential pieces too. Um, and that we can do at a congregational level, you know, but, and then how can we set those gifts on fire? Yeah, but I, I, I think the question isn't who should preach. I, I think the question isn't like, like who should preach at liturgy, but who, who has the charism for preaching and how do we set, how do we give that a space, perhaps even in our liturgy? Thank you so much for that, sir, uh, brother. And thank you, ma'am, again. Uh, we have a message from Aaron Posadas. And the question is, how should the lay deal with fake news that is rampant in social media? And how should we present the truth in the social media community? Oh man, I think that is actually one of the most important issues of the present moment, um, especially for those of us who are see ourselves as of emerging out of a Dominican charism. The concern for truth for us um, should be a, a primary concern like that for us to me is one of the greatest social justice issues of this day because we cannot create a more just world if we don't first have a picture of what that looks like, right? If we don't have a picture of what truth looks like. And so how, for at that fundamental level of what Aquinas says is that truth is having a mind that's aligned with reality. It should be of primary concern for us to make sure that we ourselves are committed to making sure that our own mind is aligned with reality, that we're only reading from really good sources and that we're, you know, making sure that we're getting a full, as full some picture of the world as possible. Um, and that it's something that we should be committed to publicly to say that truth is something that matters. Truth is something that we care about a whole lot. Um, I do see that as one of the major ways, especially lay preachers are called to get involved. Um, and I do think a lot of that conversation is happening on social media and preaching in that regard. It, doesn't need to be standing and making grand proclamations, but just <laughs> repeated in the comment, huh, I think we should check our sources here. Or I wonder if this article might be of interest to you or in the messaging, just saying like, hey, I know that both of us are really committed to truth. And I, I'm not sure, were you aware of where this article came from? I mean, those are, are many forms of, of um, I think standing up and witnessing to our ultimate value of truth that we can be doing in daily life. So I, I do think that's one of the predominant issues of our time. Thank you so much. We have another question. And the message goes, Magandang araw po, Professor Garrido. Say, that's a good day. I am Dominic Galicia from Colegio de San Juan de Letran, Bataan. I am a theology teacher for the senior high school. I would like to ask on how to be more effective in preaching or teaching to younger people, particularly students. Thank you and God bless. Wow, I think that's phenomenal. I mean, because I do think this is a place which is distinctive about Dominican education is that these values of truth and the values of the proclamation of the word can be embedded at the secondary level or I'm like all the way through Dominican education. This is something that should distinguish our schools from the other schools as a way that these values shine. Um, in the US, I know that there's an annual gathering of actually the high schools get together and send preachers, like for even the training of preachers at the high, the, that ninth through 12th grade level. Um, and I wonder like, what would that look like if that went, if that went global? Um, and the, one, the good news is that I also think there's gonna be more opportunities not just for preaching online, but for learning how to preach online. Um, I know at Aquinas Institute, that's something that we've been experimenting with. Father Greg Hiley has done such an amazing job of being a leader in that regard, of daring to step out into cyberspace long before the rest of us were willing to do it. Just like Father Scott's been a leader in building this um, Dominican family uh, site. So I wonder if onto the future, this won't be something that the group of us who are here in this room today want to collaborate on into the future. Um, something about how do we not only create spaces for people to preach, but how do we create sites and opportunities for people to learn how to be better 
at preaching too. Thank you so much, ma'am. And for our participants, we would like to entertain more questions, but due to time constraints, maybe you can take note of your messages and forward them to Professor Ann Garrido, if that would be all right. Sure, that is, yes. my, my website is angarido.com and you're most welcome to email me there um, and I will, I'll reply back. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Okay. So dear sisters and brothers, please stay, uh, please stay tuned for our video presentation. There's a very long history of Dominicans preaching, uh, not just through the spoken and written word, but also through uh, the, 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 the divine word, the logos expressed in and through visual art. Um, and there are many different ways to do this. Um, the history of Christian art is certainly very rich, not just in the Dominican order, but you know throughout Christianity, throughout Christian history. Um, and there are different uh, different forms of this that have appealed to me and that have informed my own work and my own approach to preaching through visual art. Um, probably the most influential uh, piece for me has been um, the beautiful, incredibly well-developed theology of, uh, of, of icons in the Christian East. And the idea of the icon of, of sacred art, of the sacred image, as an expression of the very mind of the church, even more so than a, an expression of any particular artist. Uh, the idea that it's the mind of Christ, uh, mediating sacramentally, it's a sacramental nexus that makes present the Paschal mystery in a very real way, um, and that draws us into prayer, into union with God. That, to me, is, is just a beautiful um, understanding of what the sacred image can be. There are also more contemporary approaches, uh, which have also influenced me in some of the pieces I've done, uh, where traditional uh, imagery, uh, sacred imagery, is put in conversation maybe with contemporary questions uh, in order to help us maybe explore, even challenge and re-articulate uh, the way that we live our faith today in, in response to different uh, challenges of our day, right? And of course, that's not a terribly original thing. A lot of artists have, have done that. A lot of Christian artists have done that. Um, but then there's also the idea that I think permeates all of these different ways of using Christian art to, to preach, to, to speak a word uh, uh, to God's people, and that is the, 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 the element of storytelling, which of course all good preaching I think involves some kind of storytelling, whether it's through words or through images. And the idea of storytelling in visual art, I mean that's very ancient and it, it's not even just limited to Christianity. Um, uh, some examples in, in the Christian, uh, in the history of Christian art, include, for instance, some beautiful images from colonial Mexico from the days of the Spanish Empire, of the story of the Virgin of Guadalupe, for example, where you see the centerpiece is the image of Guadalupe on the tilma, and then surrounding it you see a, sort of a, a sequence of squares, kind of comic strip like, telling the story of Juan Diego and of the apparitions and of Bishop Sumarraga and so forth. And then there are many instances and many pieces of art that do this, that tell the story of, for example, the life of St. Dominic or uh, the early history of the order or the life of Catherine of Siena and, and so forth. Um, so there's a way in which I love uh, the fact that sacred icons and, and sacred images can tell uh, a story. And I like the idea of the viewer being sort of invited to enter into the story as well. So an example of this uh, in my own work uh, recently is there's a wonderful book uh, that's about to go to press, um, published by New Priory Press, and it's called For the Salvation of Souls. And it is a series of um, essays and uh, writings in honor of one of the great preachers of, of my province, of, of uh, Jude Siciliano. And what I chose to do for this cover image, it's a wraparound cover, um, and it's basically a pilgrimage through history, through Dominican history. Um, and it begins up top in, in the up, upper left-hand uh, area. Uh, it explodes out kind of from, the, um, from the, the first nuns of Puglia. And then from there, you have these women and men, this, this band of preachers of 
different, you know, inspired and, and impassioned about very different things, very different from one another, from different parts of the world, from different time periods, but they're all interacting with each other on the same plane. And so you have uh, a number of them who are still alive today, uh, people maybe who um, have inspired me or who I've had the pleasure to meet, some I haven't met, some are friends of mine, um, but they are interacting with um, Dominicans who are already in the communion of saints, right? Who have already uh, made it into the canonized saints of the church, becoming part of that, that wonderful part of, uh, of the church. And they're all interacting as they move together, guided by the Holy Spirit, uh, reflected in the star over St. Dominic's head, um, mediated in and through the leadership of Dominic and of his successors. And so we see this pilgrimage through history taking us through the past 800 years into the present moment and beyond it into the kingdom to come. So anyhow, um, that's a story, that's our story. Hopefully the reader upon looking at the image and reflecting on it and maybe seeing someone they know might then remember that they're part of that journey, they're part of that. And so they too get sort of invited to enter into the story and to find a space within it. Um, and that's, to me, a, a, a fun part of uh, creating an image like that. Um, but hopefully also a way of inviting us to pray in a way that asks God, that tries to be open to the Spirit of God telling us, you know, where do you want me to be? Where are you calling me to be? How am I being called to, to preach the word, to, to, to preach your word um, to, in a world in need? Um, and, uh, and to take my cue from those who came before me and, and from the, the wisdom, the greater wisdom of the, of, of the body of Christ, of, of which I am but one member, you know? So anyhow, um, as all of us continue to find new ways to preach, uh, to make present um, the, 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 the graced power of God's word, of Christ himself, present among us, transforming us, calling us to glory, um, uh, in all the var varied ways, the myriad ways that we do it, um, you know, let's keep taking inspiration from each other. And I hope that uh, more and more we, we continue to value the, uh, the visual image, uh, the sacred image, as much as the written and the spoken word. Hey, thank you so much for that video. Uh, for all of us who are here right now and uh, are still awake, especially those who are in the Philippines or in other parts of Asia, uh, please open your video cameras and we shall have our photo up with our speaker. Our technical team will be the one in charge. Hey, say cheese. Okay. We're in the third panel, say cheese. Fourth. A fifth panel, keep smiling everyone. All panels come at random. <laughs> yes. Okay, we're now at the sixth panel. Three, two, one. Okay, thank you so much for gracing us with your beautiful smiles. And we thank you again, Professor Anne Garrido, for your wonderful preaching. Our next preacher was born in Coventry, Great Britain. She is currently a member of the monastery of Pius XII, Fatima, Portugal, an association of sister historians of the order of preachers, Fanjo, France. She earned her doctorate comparative literature in the University of Leicester in 1972. Between 1971 and 1991, she taught in various universities, including extramural departments such as Leicester University, 
Birmingham University, the Open University, specializing in distance learning. She entered the Dominican Monastery at Pelvoisin, France in 1992. In 1994, she transferred to the Dominican Monastery at Hearn, Belgium. In 1996, she earned her licensure in sacred theology from Sandra Sabre, a Jesuit faculty in Paris. And in 2000, obtained her pontifical doctorate in theology from the University of Fribourg in Switzerland. Some of her lectures and courses on Dominican history and spirituality are given in a wide variety of locations all over the world. One of the works that she gladly enjoys since 2009 is the distribution worldwide of distance learning modules for the study of Dominican history. Truly, our sister dedicates her life to her religious profession as a daughter of Saint Dominic. Dear sisters and brothers, ladies and gentlemen, let us welcome Sister Barbara Estelle Beaumont, of the Order of Preachers. Hello everybody. This is Sister Barbara greeting you from Fonjou. Fonjou, St. Dominic's village in the south of France. By the way, in case you were wondering, he is still here. We encounter him regularly as we come and go through the streets and the fields. On the video, you'll see that I have some health problems. That is, I'm on oxygen support 24 seven. So my voice isn't very strong, but I'll do the best for you that I can. My talk is called The Preaching of the Nuns, The Secret Fruit of Contemplation. And I would like to take as epigraph for this talk, a quotation from former master of the order, Bruno Cadoret. In the letter he addressed to all Dominicans, in January 2012, Father Bruno used the term evangelization to express the primary reason for the existence of the order. For preaching is only the means to the end, the means used to bring about evangelization. He goes on to explain, evangelization is not first and foremost a question of ministry, but an invitation to a certain way of life. Is it not exactly in this sense that the nuns of the order play their part in its preaching mission? For the nuns certainly do not have a formal preaching ministry. To be honest, I don't think the majority of nuns wish for one, but it is indeed the option for a certain way of life and a radical option at that, that makes of nuns evangelizers and hence preachers according to the definition of Father Bruno. The logic is evident. The purpose of preaching is evangelization, and the purpose of evangelization is the salvation of souls. This is the quintessence of the Dominican vocation and of all Dominican life. So we can't speak of the preaching of the nuns in conventional terms, and we shouldn't even try. Why? because there is first and foremost the relation of the nuns to the mystical body of Christ, the mystical dimension of our way of life, which cannot be put into words. Perfecte caritatis and verbi spons of Vatican documents speak eloquently of this, as well as other sources for those who would like to investigate further. We must not forget that every baptized person is called to preach to preach, to preach Christ, to live Christ, though sadly we are not taught the meaning of this explicitly enough from our early years. Yet what is it to preach? If we speak in the conventional sense of preaching as the dictionary defines it, that is to proclaim or declare in public, then we can easily understand public preaching of the word with words as the friars are called to do, but also wearing the habit, the witness and a proclamation of a life in common, the witness of a life of poverty. All of these constitute a direct and humble declaration, a sign pointing to God. It was after all Bishop Diego 
who enjoined on the papal legates that they must preach by word and example. And in this way, Dominic began to preach to the Cathars, meeting them where they were at, so to speak. And yes, miracles happened. So we come to the question, is there a conflict between being a contemplative and being a preacheress? As the nuns don't preach in the conventional sense, how do they live out this dimension of the mission of the order in the context of contemplative life? First of all, simply because they have received the mission of prayer in the heart of the church, the prayer of praise and intercession in total gift to the Lord, such is their vocation and hence their mission. In the communion of saints, the word of God which we welcome and desire to put into practice does not return to the Father without moving hearts towards salvation. The nuns are to be love at the heart of the church. I will be love at the heart of the church, said St. Therese of Lisieux, now doctor of the church. Though coming from a Carmelite, this rule truly does apply to all who are called to the monastic contemplative life. From the beginning, for the nun, it is a matter of a covenant of love, a radical consecration of love. To the very end, it is a covenant of love. In eternity, it is only love. By their fruit shall you know them, is a well-known biblical adage, and we must apply it to the preaching of Dominican nuns, as indeed to preachers in general. In our order, we speak of the fruits of contemplation and the communication of such fruits to others. We must bear in mind, however, that the transmission of such fruits is not an automatic process. As with the parable of the sower, certain conditions need to be fulfilled in order for the fruitfulness of the grain to be bountiful. In the case of the nuns, it does not suffice simply to lock oneself up in a cloister and then go about one's own business, prioress, bursa, novice, cook, or whatever it may be. There is a community dimension to contemplation, as indeed to the transmission of its fruits. St. Athanasius refers to the folly of preaching, which God ordained as the route to salvation for believers. And yet this is described as folly, as an order of preachers. I think we understand this very well. We realize that you have to be not a little mad to undertake such a mission. And this is probably even more so in the case of the nuns. For the friars who go out and preach in various locations can often, but not always, see the fruits of their labors. They see the reactions on the faces of the congregation. They get feedback in various ways. They can sometimes be aware of having touched people's lives deeply. On the other hand, it is very rare, almost impossible, for the nuns to know whether their form of preaching is effective. For theirs is a more discreet and often silent form of witness, bearing a fruit that remains mostly secret, but nonetheless real. For as Pope Pius XII said, the life of the nun is totally apostolic. Nuns should certainly not be like Victorian children, that is, seen and not heard, or in some cases not even seen. Preaching is by definition a form of communication. If nuns are to be considered as evangelizers and preachers, there must necessarily be communication in some form or other. A praying presence that is totally unseen and unheard certainly has a value in the purely spiritual or supernatural domain. This might be the case, for example, with the way of life of Carmelite nuns. But to my mind, it does not correspond to the charism of Dominican nuns. 
the Holy Spirit loosens our tongue when he wishes, and we share the word whom we ponder and prayerfully study day after day with the help of Our Lady, Mother of the Word, and first of the disciples. We may do this in brief reflections offered to our sisters in community, in writing through art, in translation, in receiving visitors or pilgrims, especially in monasteries like those at Fatima or Lord, where hospitality for pilgrims from all parts of the world is part of the life of the community. Interestingly enough, in the early times of the order, the nuns were referred to as sister preacheresses and not as Dominican nuns. One can justifiably argue that at that time the term Dominicans was not in general use. Yet it is surely significant that at this early stage the identity of the nuns was associated with the preaching mission. Indeed, before it became a formal monastery, the community at Pruya was known as the Holy Preaching, because this first foundation, besides housing nuns, served as a sort of refueling station for Bishop Diego, Dominic, and their group of preachers. And later on, the foundations of Dominican nuns that proliferated all over Europe in the 13th and 14th centuries were referred to in the local languages as sister preacheresses. Indeed, the ancient university towns of Louvain and Antwerp in Belgium still have their Predikerinenstraat, or preacheresses street. The nuns could easily have been called daughters of St. Dominic or something similar. But although their monasteries have long since disappeared in these towns through the various vicissitudes of history, the memory of the nuns' association with the preaching ministry lives on through the names of these streets. The preaching of the nuns should always be collective, not individual. That is to say, it needs to be a function of the whole monastic community, not just of certain individuals. This is true of the friars also, of course, but this community dimension is much more radical in the case of the nuns, as we shall see shortly when we examine some aspects of their constitutions. The desire of St. Dominic that preaching should be by both word and example is crucial to the mission of the nuns, for they use words sparingly in a life comprised in great part of silence that silence that provides the necessary nourishment for prayer. So in what does the exemplo of the nuns consist? How does it communicate itself? How does it become witness? And hence, how does it qualify as preaching and bear fruit? No one refers to Benedictine nuns or Carmelites as preacheresses. How are our nuns different? Or how should they be different? Maybe we aren't always as different as we should be. Maybe we need to be more aware of what our specific mission is as contemplatives in the apostolic order of preachers. This ecclesial mission is lived out in following St. Dominic, who attracted women to the order by a particular grace-filled fragrance as St. Catherine of Siena put it. This grace is that love of truth which finds expression in the Word made flesh and hence the importance of the scriptures in Dominican life. This Word is assiduously heard and studied, prayed and contemplated, releasing another fragrance, that of compassion for all those who thirst for happiness and pass by its source without even recognizing it. In considering the significance of the term preacheresses, it is important to be aware of the dangers of anachronism. In the 20th century, there was a temptation to imagine, given that Dominic founded a community of sisters before the foundation of the order of preachers, and that he introduced a certain number of innovations 
to the form of religious life that he founded, that he had had in mind some form of mixed group of men and women who would travel through the countryside on itinerant preaching missions, and that subsequently the villainous friars and or the villainous pope quashed this idea. Now, much as this vision of the past might appeal to those who have a certain notion of what liberty is, it is pure fantasy. Not only is there no evidence whatsoever that such was Dominic's intention, but it is totally anachronistic in the context of the period and in the context of Dominic's own life. He was essentially a man of the church and a man of his time. Innovation is one thing, flaunting social convention and ecclesial discipline is something else. On the other hand, it has been said from the beginnings that the Dominican sisters support the preaching of the friars through their prayer, and this is true, though it must not be interpreted in the sense that the intense prayer life of the nuns dispenses the friars from making much effort in that domain themselves. In addition to this support to the friars, they provide it to a wide spectrum of people by offering through their chapels and guest houses places of prayer and silence to those who visit them and spend time with them. Thus their very communities themselves become a preaching. This is the simple way of looking at it, but the metaphysics run much deeper. What we frequently hear these days, in fact, is that the way of life of the nuns is in itself a form of preaching. And this is what I have been hinting at in this talk. Yes, but there are also dangers implicit in this approach. Let's look a little closer at this problematic. If the monastery is surrounded by high enclosure walls, if the liturgy takes place in an inner sanctum invisible to outside worshippers, if the singing is pretty much inaudible, if all external functions answering the doorbell, the telephone, running the guest house or the monastery shop are all fulfilled by lay helpers, the nuns can indeed be invisible. All hell might be let loose inside that enclosure, yet all may look serene on the outside. Father Gerard, Master of the Order, wrote in a letter offered to our nuns for reflection in September 2019, I quote, However, when a nun refuses to speak with another nun, or deliberately ignores her presence, or worse, makes life difficult for her, she is not promoting that vocation. Invisibility can cover a multitude of sins, and sins are collective as well as individual. Indeed, the constitutions of the Dominican nuns clearly state if the life of the nuns is a sign, there must be a possibility of interpreting this sign. That is to say, hidden should not mean invisible, and silent should mean 14, we read. In the various dealings of the monastery with neighbours, guests and others, the nuns should manifest a charity which, despite their hidden life, will form a bond of unity with them. This applies particularly to the prioress and other nuns whose positions require more frequent contact with persons outside the monastery. But the whole community, united as it is in the love of the Lord, should become a radiant centre of charity to all. Imagine a call to collective radiance. Now that is quite a challenge. It requires an enormous transcendence of self. Obviously it does not mean grinning from ear to ear the whole time, but there can be no question of grimacing at a sister across the choir. No slouching in your stall if you have a backache. A way of life that can appear unnatural to some people must necessarily 
be a challenge to certain preconceptions when it is seen that apparently normal or even good-looking young women are attracted to it. And so our mission requires us to be signs. In this also we are commissioned by the Church, for if women who do not speak out in the conventional manner in front of a congregation can yet be called preacheresses, it is indeed their choice of a way of life that has something to say, to communicate a life straining towards God through the hope and desire for eternal happiness in Him and the mysterious fecundity of a life offered with Christ for the transfiguration of humanity. The centrality in the life of Dominican nuns of the Word of God in the Scriptures is a key concept here. It cannot be emphasized too much. The Sacra Pagina is the focus par excellence of our study, our liturgy, our meditation and our contemplation. As we read in the prophet Isaiah, the word does not return to the Father before having engendered salvation in the heart. It is in this that the efficacy of the nuns as preachers consists. Notions of what constitutes preaching have evolved over time. Fra Angelico and other artists are now rightly deemed to have preached through pictorial representation, and this is indeed a form of communication. Nuns have always been active in this field also, more in fact than one might think. Monastic art is often associated with a mystical dimension. What do we mean by mystical in this sense? A mystic is essentially someone who has a capacity for an experience of God that he or she seeks to communicate to others. Without this element of communication, it is impossible to ascertain who is a mystic and who is not. It is normal that monastic art should seek to communicate something of the experience of God as lived by the artist in the monastery. So what of art in Dominican monasticism? Remembering that Dominican monasticism is exclusively feminine. There are no Dominican monks, only friars. From the earliest days of the order in the 13th century, we find nuns engaged in artistic and creative intellectual pursuits that were considered to be an integral part of the preaching mission of the Dominican order. If we take as example the Dominican nuns in the German-speaking countries, we find women who are far more active in the artistic and intellectual sphere than the average lay woman of the day. It is said that Dominican nuns were the best educated women in Europe at the time. Dominican nuns certainly did their share of illuminating manuscripts with decorated capitals and miniatures. In fact, the Dominican convert at Ertenbach where we have a document of 1340, tells of two sisters who were so competent at book production that they earned 10 marks a year for their new, newly founded community, and they were the principal source of support for that monastery. It seems clear that creating art was an important spiritual need, and new forms of it unique to women, such as the famous sister books, developed and the number of works increased exponentially over the course of the 14th and 15th centuries. Let us have a look at the Italian Renaissance and see the amazing figure of Sister Plotilla Nelli, whose dates are 1524 to 1588. She is often referred to as the painter prioress of Renaissance Florence and in fact was the first woman painter of any category at all to achieve fame in Florence and she featured in the famous book The Lives of the Artists by Vasari. Her noteworthy talent still has the potential to inspire the modern mind. She was prioress of the monastery of Santa Caterina da Siena on the Piazza San Marco in Florence and so she lived right next door to the convent where Fra Angelico had painted a century before. 
The story of this painter Prioris has to be situated in the context not only of the art world in 16th century Florence, but in the wider context also of Dominican preaching in that place and time. Sister Plautilla was a true disciple of the famous Dominican preacher Girolamo Savonarola, who sought to launch a widespread moral and political reform of Florentine society, in which art occupied a leading role. Savonarola affirmed the great value of religious art and the centrality of its content, and Sister Plotilla followed him in this. In a series of incisive declarations, the friar exhorted artists to eliminate from their works all elements that, in his opinion, constituted distraction from the sacred themes or departures from the truth. Sister Plautilla's most famous work, The Lamentation of Christ, which has been recently restored and much acclaimed, clearly illustrates the purity of artistic style and purpose that Savonarola promoted. Sister Plautilla depicts the body of Jesus lying on a stone on the ground, with St John holding the body Mary Magdalene embracing the feet and the Virgin Mary kneeling on the ground nearby. There is nothing at all to distract from the intensity of this moment. The poignancy is palpable. Interestingly enough, Sister Plotilla Nelly features along with other nuns of her monastery in a work published by the Dominican friar Serafino Razzi in 1596. His work is entitled The History of Famous Men in Preaching and Theology in the Sacred Order of Preachers. Note famous men in preaching, and it includes nuns. Now I'm not too sure that a Dominican writing a book with that title today would think to include nun artists. I'd like to be wrong. On the whole, nuns tend to be reticent or over modest about sharing the fruits of their contemplation. But besides preaching in the form of artistic expression, pictural or literary, such as we've been talking about, I firmly believe that there is room in their life, the life of the nuns, for some form of verbal preaching. In the life of the monastery, there is surely some scope for doing this without breaking the law of enclosure or infringing the discipline of the church. For example, a sister could very well give a very short preaching at Sunday Vespers, whether the faithful be present or not. Similarly, at the Office of Vigils, on the occasion of major feasts, if only for the edification of her own community. I have a vivid memory of my own prioress, a woman who would shun a public preaching ministry and who has the greatest respect for monastic enclosure preaching from the front doorway of our monastery. On the Feast of the Holy Rosary a couple of years ago, she spoke at their invitation to a large group of lay Dominicans in Fatima for their World Congress. The Master of the Order and many members of the Dominican Curia were also present and assembled in the front garden of the monastery. She spoke to them in a very relevant and gripping manner of St. Dominic and the Rosary. She didn't show a PowerPoint or a video, but simply used as a visual aid the large statue of St. Dominic and the Blessed Virgin Mary that stood there in their midst in the monastery garden. No rules were infringed, and this preaching was probably more memorable and more salvific than many a Sunday homily. In conclusion then, historically, there have been two radically opposing reactions to this subject. Firstly, the preaching of the nuns. Quite simply, they don't. Secondly, often heard these days, the preaching of the nuns. They are the preaching. Both of these statements are simplistic, containing part of the truth, but not the whole truth. We are all familiar with the situation where a person laments 
I am of no use to anybody. And such persons are frequently comforted by the response. Ah, oh, it's not what you do, it's what you are. This reply is often proffered to the older relatives in a family. But let's face it, the nuns are the elder sisters of the friars. Having been founded in 1206 at Pouya, they were 10 years old when the friars were born in 1216. Now that is quite an age gap in any family, something to be considered as significant. Those who have older sisters may like to ponder on the contribution they made to the well-being of their younger brothers, independently of any specific actions on their part. This is simply part of the dynamic of family life, but not, must not be taken for granted. All members of all families have responsibilities towards the other members. We are aware these days that the very concept of Dominican family as its opponents, although the term was used as long ago as the 16th century. Finally, I believe that we can be sure that our Holy Father Dominic was in contact, constant contact with the first disciple of Christ, his most holy mother, who pondered all the divine mysteries in her immaculate heart. We cannot forget that she is the queen of preachers and star of evangelization. Now at the beginning of the third millennium, we continue to live this same charism to the extent that we faithfully imitate Dominic as he imitated Christ. Thank you so much for your wonderful insights, Sister Barbara. We learned how simply amazing are the nun's devout way of life. Your vows and your regular observances in the context of contemplative life are direct and humble proclamation in your ministry as preacheresses. Indeed, the mystical dimension of such vocation cannot be put to words. And we also thank our sister nuns who have been praying for us in our preaching. At this juncture, we shall have our reactors. We first call Sister Maria Elvira Delfonso OP of Our Lady of the Rosary Monastery, Cainta Rizal. Good evening, sister. Sister, you're still muted. Uh, okay. Um, good evening, everyone. Good evening, sister. I am in agreement with Sister Barbara about the sign value of the contemplative life of the nuns of the order. And this uh, sign value is best expressed not only individually, but also as a community. That nuns <clears throat> best offer the example of their lives as their preaching. Their, content, their contemplation, the fruits of their contemplation is their um, contribution to the preaching of the order. They support our preachers by being preacheresses themselves in their own lives. Sister has also said about um, the preaching of the nuns through art and writing, which I believe have to be um, explored more by the nuns in the order.
and also the elements of communication in our monastic life are varied in the sense that we ourselves can become preachers to one another in community. And uh, for example, um, I, I was just reminded that um, as communities of contemplative nuns in the order, we preach to one another, for example, when we share um, the gospel, our experiences in faith to one another openly and um, candidly. And also that no. we um, <laughs> Would you believe it? try to help one another live up to our uh, contemplative vocation. Um, also, Sister expressed um, that um, there are times when to the people outside, we can preach. For example, our parlor can be a place of preaching when we welcome people from outside, speak to them of God in a way that we ourselves can do um, without having to um, seek for formal ways of preaching. I think um, also the practice of our lives as our constitutions um, delineate is very important contribution to the order. And the nuns can only be um, fruitful in preaching by being uh, fruits themselves by their own contemplation. Contemplation itself is the preaching of the nuns. And I think um, this uh, the example of their lives cannot be you know, emphasized too much, but uh, it is something that it, they have to live because our life is simply, you know, um, a light for the order. It is a light because it is our own lives that is the source of our preaching. We may not be saying much, but our lives have to say enough to be able to bring God and to the world and our silence and contemplation, the enclosure itself will be able to reach out to people in ways that maybe we do not know how. We would not know how, only God knows. And I think it is faith that makes us believe that we have our own contribution to the preaching of the order. Thank you very much. Yes, thank you so much, Sister Elvira. Now we call on Sister Mary Emanuel Cruz OP of Our Lady of Angels Monastery, Bokawe, Bulacan. Good evening, Sister. Sister, we, uh, you're not yet audible to us participants.
Sister, maybe we can test your microphone again. Sister, maybe you can try to uh, pull again your headset from the computer, then uh, put it back. Or maybe you can try uh, listening to the conference without it. Would that be possible? Because we cannot hear you. Sister. Sister, can you try putting back the Hello po. <laughs> ah, yeah. Okay, now we can hear you. We can hear you. We can hear you a while ago. A while ago, we were able to hear you po, sister. Well, I think before you plugged it in again, maybe you just need to move closer to your device. Okay. Yeah. Yes, sister. Now we can okay. hear. You. Thank you so much. Okay. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank uh, Sister Barbara for her talk, um, and we've been we were able to meet and work together before. <laughs> and so, what I would like to share is, the sister said about being evangelizer, and our mission in the order in the church as preachers. And you mentioned, she mentioned about this love, this radical love that in the uh, quoting St. Therese, the, in the heart of the church, we are loved and we ourselves are loved by the church. And I believe we are very much loved by the order. <laughs> and so for this, the example and words that we give witness to as a sign of preaching, our silence, solitude, and at the same time, our visibility with the people and through our presence. The presence of a monastery is just like Father Timothy said, is like a city on a hill. And therefore, we are here to, to pray and to communicate with people and to communicate that what we are carrying in our hearts, that is the mystical body of Christ. Yesterday, Father Master said that a young sister in Kalarwega wrote a book that entitled Between Silence and Word. And I think between that is the mystical body of Christ, which binds us together. He said that the fruits of our contemplation is what we carry, or what we bear witness to, to the people we encounter, first in the community, and then to those who come to the monastery. This way, he, she quoted uh, Isaiah too, that this word should not return to God empty, but bear fruit. And it's pointing to eternity. 
the salvation of souls for which Saint Dominic uh, founded the order. There is a call to meet the conflicts or let's say uh, how we reconcile the conflicts that at the present day the nuns are encountering in the world and even inside the community. So this is a radical vocation that calls also to live in poverty, particularly in this time of pandemic that we have uh, experienced to have just enough that we need and being able to share with others the hospitality of the monastery, to welcome guests, to welcome the poor in our doors and to share with them what we have. Mission is a call to leave the gospel and we have to bear witness to the mission. The word of God we share among us and even in social media that it remain as a sign of the times, a sign to communicate God's word to them and bring them closer to God in prayer. There are many things I can share and all these things some of you know already, but the nuns I believe is this sign that or reference point of all of us in the order where, where we are called to intercessory prayer to heal the wounds of many in the world through our prayer. And so we carry you all in this life of prayer, as I believe you also do for us, that the contemplative life of the nuns may be fruitful and flourish in the church, particularly in the order, and attract more vocations. That's all, thank you. Thank you so much, sister. And since everybody's still here with our sisters whom uh, uh, we are excited to meet most of the time because we seldom <laughs> visit them, especially during this time of the pandemic, maybe we can have a photo op with you. For those who have the sisters in their community with them, maybe you can share your screen also. Sister Mary Manuel, are you alone or also with the, the other sisters? Maybe you can... <laughs> Uh, ask them to join. And uh, right this time, now, I, I'm just alone. <laughs> yeah, because it's already right, yeah. almost midnight. Yeah. <laughs> and you have to wake up for matins. Okay, so sisters, assemble. <laughs> okay. okay. Now our technical team will be the one to uh, uh, call for screenshot. Okay, first panel. Say cheese. Cheese. Okay. Keep smiling because all panels go at random. Okay, second panel. One, two, three. Okay, third panel. Fourth panel. Now we go to the fifth panel. Okay. Sixth panel, your biggest smile. And three, two, one. One more. Three, two, one, smile. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you for gracing us with your infectious smiles for that photo op. I guess it's everyone's sentiment, dear sister nuns in the Philippines, that in our Dominican student date, we really miss visiting you, especially during Christmas to sing you some Christmas carols. And right now, uh, especially with sister Barbara, we also learned that you are a good example of what every community should live out. Like uh, what both of you mentioned, 
the sharing of gospel and experiences of faith, not only among your communities, but even welcoming the poor by your monastery doors. And above all, that you are preaching by being fruits of your own contemplation, bearing witness to the mission as intercessors to our prayers. So thank you again. A blessed evening. Good day to everyone. Now for all our participants, please be reminded that the Institute of Preaching has sent you an evaluation form for day two to accomplish. We are also sending the link in the chat box so you can be directed to the online evaluation form. And be reminded that you will automatically get your certificate of participation in today's event after the evaluation. Should you encounter problems or technical difficulties in either answering the form or receiving your e-certificate, please send us an email at urbi at orbi 2021 at letran.edu.ph. Again, that is urbi at orbi 2021 at letran.edu.ph. So our dear friends, we are grateful to have you with us this day. And see you tomorrow for the third day of Urbi et Orbi. To end today's activity, we shall have our closing prayer. See you tomorrow. No for Martins.
We we can have Martin as father, Roy. <laughs> But we don't need to wake up very early tomorrow. Nice punchline. <laughs> <laughs>